Some people uh, aren't very attracted to war history, but they're very attracted to a certain dimension of war. And that is the espionage codebreaker uh, side to war. And I have to admit that there is a certain fascination inside of me towards that end. And maybe it's just how I grew up. My dad was one of those spy uh, lovers, you know, or if it was a spy novel or if it was a spy movie, he always liked that. And so I grew up around that. I also grew up around boxing, you know, so it's sort of like, you know, you can find yourself attracted to some strange things growing up when that's what you're around. And so I remember it's like, go, 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 as some guy's beating someone in the face. And then as, you know, after a while, I think, you know what, I'm not exactly sure if this is the healthiest thing to cheer on. <laughs> but uh, it is interesting how our upbringing can cause us to have affection and affinities for things that are a little sketchy at times. But uh, this is uh, a fun message in that regard, is that we're touching on something that is a very, very crucial part of World War I. And I'm actually going to go into somewhat of the background of it. I mean, every story I'm giving, if you're an expert on World War I, you know is skim milk. I mean, it's like I'm just sort of skating along the surface, giving a brief introduction to something, because to go in depth into any, even one character could be a whole uh, storyline in and of itself. And so we're, we're sort of hanging out on the surface levels of the story, but hopefully going deep in regards to how that impacts us. And that's part of the fun of dealing with the history. At the same time, the whole point isn't really the history, it's the Christ life uh, that we can excavate out of it. Uh, this would have been great to save for uh, episode 40. You have to admit, you know, when it's called Room 40, but it's like uh, episode 30, Room 40. Uh, it's sort of a, a funny uh, one. But uh, part 30, room 40, the British codebreakers. Doesn't that just, I mean, I could have called this the British codebreakers and probably got a lot more uh, downloads on it just because there's something about that that is extremely fascinating. But it would have messed with the very principle of the message, which is the reason that this is called room 40 is because it doesn't draw attention to itself. It's very, very purposefully that. And it's interesting because that's a principle in the kingdom of heaven. God Almighty is going to come to this earth. If there was any guy who just should wear it on his sleeve and show off a bit, it would be God in human skin. And yet, even when you look into the Old Testament and you see the first tabernacle that is being designed, it's like covered in badger skin. And you could almost say it this way, it's plain in a certain regard to cover something that is very unplain. In other words, what is inside is glorious, but what is on the outside doesn't necessarily show off in the way that you would think it should. And Jesus, in the life of Jesus, is very similar to that. And uh, that there is nothing in his ordinary bearing that would cause us to be attracted in an extraordinary fashion. And yet, whatever he is housing is something so glorious and so beautiful and so lovely, and yet in normal, plain garb, if you will. And extra interesting is that's the same with us as the church, that we are housing the glories of the heavenlies, and yet we are rather plain in our bearing, not many rich, not many uh, famous, not many wealthy amongst us. It's just sort of the average character that makes up the church of Jesus Christ, at least the triumphant version of it. And that's, in essence, what Room 40 is. It's named Room 40 on purpose so that no one thinks twice about it. Isn't that interesting? But what is going on in Room 40 is quite spectacular. So the British Codebreakers, here's a, a little peek inside of Room 40. Actually, I, it, it's funny because if you try and get a picture of Room 40, this is what you get, the one picture of Room 40. I don't even know if it is of Room 1, or I'm sorry, did I say 140? Of Room 40. And so, but it is still a fascinating one. It almost seems staged, like the guy in the back is supposedly reading the paper. Uh, and so I don't know if this is actually Room 40, but that's... Uh, that's what's gone down in history is a picture of room 40. Technically, by the end of World War I, there were 800 people working in room 40. So you get the idea that room 40 didn't stay a little room. Uh, somewhere along the line, it expanded, but was still called room 40. 
So in the, Admiral, the Admiralty, Admiralty Building uh, in uh, London, you're going to see uh, room 40, just four uh, rooms down from boardroom 36. And nothing special, right? And that's where this is all going to begin. So to understand room 40, you really need to understand the legend of Admiral Hull. So here's a picture of Admiral Hull. Isn't he a fascinating looking character? Uh, I guess he was rather intimidating uh, if you hung out with him. Any admiral has to be a pretty tough cookie. Uh, the British Navy is the most powerful navy in the world, and this is going to become one of the most powerful men in the world. It's hard to even liken him to someone because he's a combination between almost like a, uh, a Winston Churchill meets Sherlock Holmes. He's a very fascinating character in his own right. And uh, so here's a couple descriptions uh, from Barbara Tuckman's Zimmerman Telegram. Admiral Hall was ruthless, sometimes cruel, always resourceful. His piercing eye, his unrelenting drive, his magnetism could get anything he wanted out of anybody. Huh. And a small ruddy man with authority in his step and an admiral's gold stripes on his sleeve. The physical presence of Admiral Sir William Reginald Hall frequently nerved in men an impulse to do something heroic. Isn't that a great description of someone? So Room 40, a boring name to a very intriguing work. So for those of you that don't know anything about the British uh, spy network, uh, then this is not probably going to satisfy you at the level that a novel on it or a, a movie on it, because there's loads of them that have been created over time. Uh, even, on, even a book called Room 40, there's a whole bunch of them. In other words, this is so intriguing to people's minds. Now there's a podcast called Room 40, you know, a podcast episode. So it, it's a very, it, it's funny because I think a lot of us, when we look into World War I, we see the simplicity and the plainness of it that it attracts us. And we, it's sort of like, I like that, Room 40. And then that becomes symbolic of something. Symbolic of something very plain and hidden and humble that is doing a great work. So it's a boring name to a very intriguing work. So this is what Barbara Tuckman says. She says, 800 code breakers working tirelessly was carefully masked by a bland pretense of ordinariness. Uh, in other words, hey, nothing going on here. Nothing to see here. Just keep walking down the hall. Uh, yeah, boardroom 36 is just right down the hall. Yeah, I'm sure you're looking for that. Room 40, nothing here to see. The beginnings of room 40. So Barbara Tuckman says, Room 40 had sprung from an act done in the first hours of the war. England had declared war at midnight on August 4th. So if you've gone through this whole series, you can sort of hearken back to August 4th, 1914, when the British give the ultimatum to the Germans to basically back out of Belgium and to declare that there, this was a mistake, that they invaded neutral Belgium. And if they don't, then Great Britain needs to declare war and the Germans have no intention of pulling out. They're on a clock. They have 39 hours to take Paris, or I'm sorry, 39 days to take Paris, and so the clock is ticking. And so at midnight, as that same clock is ticking in Great Britain, Great Britain declares war. And before the sun rose the next morning, a ship, a ship moved slowly through the mist over the North Sea until she reached a point some miles off Emden where the Dutch coast joins the German. In the half-darkness, she began to fish in a manner that was strangely clumsy yet purposeful. Heavily, heavy grappling irons were plunged into the water, dragged along the bottom, and hauled up, bringing with them an eel-shaped catch, dripping mud and slime, that clanged against the ship's side with a metallic sound. Several times the maneuver was repeated, and each time the eel-like shapes were cut and cast back into the sea. They were the German transatlantic cables. A few days later, she returned to the North Sea, speaking of the ship, and to exclude any possibility of repair, wound up the severed cable ends on her drums and carried them back home. It was England's first offensive action of the war and was to have results more lethal than were dreamed of when the Committee of Imperial Defense planned the action back in 1912. So the British, for whatever reason, are very skilled in espionage and thinking things like this through. It's almost like a he-he-he type of quality that the British seem to have. 
And what's interesting, and I mean, I almost want to say extra interesting, is the Germans feel like they have the edge with the he he he, and they feel like they are so far beyond every other nation, and especially Great Britain. In their mind, Great Britain isn't that smart. And that is actually what is going to cost the Germans, is that they underestimate the British, and they overinflate their own brilliance, which is extremely interesting in World War I. So back in 1912, the British have already, you know, because this was looming on the horizon. Again, for those of you that missed the early episodes, World War I, it wasn't thought of as World War I. It's just a coming war, a European conflict. It was obvious that there were tensions here. And so the British had to posture themselves with thoughts. And so you play war games. You, you walk through scenarios to actually prepare and to figure out what you need in place if something happens. And the uh, Imperial Defense is going to think through the first actions they would want to do if, if they were ended up at war with Germany. And that is to cut the transatlantic cables. That's the communication with different parts of the world. And so one transatlantic cable, which is maybe the most significant, significant in World War I, is going to be the one that goes all the way across to the United States. And that's one long cable. I mean, if you think about that, that that's, that's quite an impressive uh, feat that was even being done in the early 1900s. And yet the, the British, their first act is to disable that. And of course, since they have the strongest Navy, it's going to be really hard to relay that, if you, you know, to put it back down. So as a result, for the entire war, the Germans are without their transatlantic cable communications, which... Like it, say, like it says, Barbara Tuckman says, I should say, was more lethal than they would have even guessed as far as how that's going to play into the war. Because some people would say that it's actually the British spy network that won World War I. Now, that's an arguable statement, but there are reasons why they've come to that conclusion. And so that one act actually plays a big role. From that moment on, for the duration of the war, Germany was sealed off from direct cable communication with the overseas world, and the burden of commu communication fell on Nauen, the powerful German wireless station, a few miles outside Berlin. So Berlin being the capital of Germany, they had a wireless station a few miles outside, and so that became their hub of communication. Nothing can stop an enemy from picking wireless messages out of the free air, and nothing did. In England, Room 40 was born. Oh, don't you guys like that? Isn't that intriguing? So Room 40 is set up to catch wireless communications, you know, grab it out of the air and intercept it. However, the, the, the Germans are not dumb. If they're going to send a wireless communication, they're going to do whatever it takes to make it so that no other human on earth could understand it. And so, as a result, now you have the battle, the battle of wits that is going to take place. The Germans need to communicate. This is their hub of communication for everything that they are doing on the front lines, with other nations, all their negotiations. Everything's taking place, and Room 40 <clears throat> is set up to catch it. And that's, that's part of the, I mean, the smirk in the, in the British uh, side of things. It's like, are you serious? You guys actually have access to that? Shh. Don't say a word. Call us Room 40. <laughs> Room 40 recruited more assistance. So this is sort of in the flow of a statement uh, that Barbara Tuckman is making because it is exploding. There's suddenly the Germans to try and outsmart everyone are sending the same communication like five times in five different ways. And so as a result, they need to somehow catch all these and figure out a way to, I mean, at first they have no way of breaking the code to even interpret them, right? So they're catching them and studying them. However, when they realize it's the same note being sent five different places to try and confuse them, it actually helps them. Because now they say these five things all say the same thing. And so you have some very smart Brits uh, when it comes down to it that are going to be sort of problem solving. This is like the ultimate Sudoku puzzle. So if you were a, a gamer, this is like your dream is to be in the code breaking room. If you could get a job in room 40, it would be your dream. So this is who they're picking. It's interesting. So room 40 recruited more assistants, university dons, barristers, linguists, accountants with a flair for mathematical pattern, 
all men who went into battle against the ciphers with a zest for the intellectual challenge. There were a lot, it's, it makes it sound like it was all men. There were a lot of women involved in this too. And even if you saw the original picture from room 40, you're like, I, I think I saw some women in there. And that's true. There were women, uh, as far as I understand, have a great mind as well and are very good with these types of things. <clears throat> that was a bone that I just threw to all the women there. Ciphers and codes, what's the difference? Now, I'm not one of those guys that really should be answering questions like this. I'm, I mean, I understand, like I, I like codes, like if you had your little code book and you could interpret uh, this, this other uh, concept over here by using that code book to, uh, to solve, that's fun for me. And I, I loved, loved those things as a kid. As a kid, I don't hang out doing that type of thing very often anymore. But if you ask me what the difference between a cipher and a code was at first, I don't think I would be able to just easily answer. But what's the difference? So ciphers differ from a code in that it is constructed upon a systematic method in which one letter or group of letters or number or group of numbers represents another letter or group according to some prearranged pattern. Code, on the other hand, is based on arbitrary substitution in which the substitutions are listed in a code book made up by the encoder. Generally, although not always, when the Germans used code, they wrapped it inside an extra covering of cipher. That is, they enciphered the code. So not only do you need the code book to understand what the Germans are speaking, because the only way you could interpret it and translate it is you're, you need a piece of information. That's a code book. But then they are going to encipher that. So it is multiple layers deep from being able to be solved. So the Germans in their he 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 uh, back in Germany are thinking there's no way, even if someone intercepts this, that they could possibly uh, break this. Of course, did they realize who they were messing with? They're messing with the British and the British don't like to have a problem they can't solve. Attempting to do the impossible and break the German enciphered code. So it's not just break the code, it's break, they have to break the cipher and then the code without a code book. Okay, so what, you're, what we're saying right here is every German or all the thinking Germans that were behind all this would say that it's humanly impossible. There is no way, the, uh, the, the mathematical odds are like one in, the tr one in the trillions, okay, that someone could actually solve this. And that's part of the, like I said, the humor, if you want to look at it, if you're German, it's probably not humorous, but the humor of World War I and the British spy network. To the ordinary mind, it seems impossible that a code based on substitutions arbitrarily chosen by the encoder can be solved, or as the cryptographers say, reconstructed, by a person not in possession of the code book. Yet in time, with a sufficient number of messages to compare with ingenuity, endless patience, and sparks of inspired guessing, it can be done. Now, there's a, there's a little twist to the story here because Barbara Tuckman says that, and then I'm going to read to you uh, the next line that she is going to say, which is actually rather humorous. Okay, so the German code book, which no one has. I mean, they, the Germans don't just hand over their code book. However, there's a unique story that's gonna happen. I don't remember where it took place, but it's the Russians and the Germans. The Russian Navy is going to encounter a German ship and it's trying to get away. They catch up with it. And this German ship actually had a code book. And this code book, they have a very specific protocol that happens if there is a hostile takeover of a ship. So the man, one man is assigned and he has a lead weight attached. It's like wrapped in a lead wrap, the, the, the code book is, so that they get it far from the ship and drop it into the sea and it will go like a rock to the bottom of the ocean, right? And no one will ever know. So this man gets into his dinghy, you know, the lifeboat, and he's like rowing away and he gets shot. And when he gets shot, instead of dropping the book, his, his body clamps onto the book. And so he's laying there and he falls over and he's like floating in the ocean and the Germans, or I'm sorry, the Russians capture him, bring him aboard and then pry this out of his dead hand and it's a German code book. So we can be impressed with the British, they may not want you to know this, uh, that they didn't just solve the code, they did get a little help. They came by the German code book. 
One has only to imagine the infinite difficulty of the process of breaking an enciphered code to realize the worth of the shortcut provided when a copy of the enemy codebook is captured. Isn't this fun? Aren't you guys enjoying this? I mean, there's something about espionage that is very intriguing to us. And the fact that it is all part of the story and the fact that you're trusting that some spiritual value will come out of this message. <laughs> the vulnerability of the German. Now, we've, we've recognized a lot of vulnerabilities to the Germans. And I, I feel bad, you know, being German, I, I, I've definitely thrown the Germans under the bus uh, in World War I. They are the aggressor in World War I. And they, they have some built-in challenges that we're going to see continue to grow into World War II, which is they have a tendency to think of themselves as superior. They think of their thoughts as superior, their science as superior, their music as superior. And most of the world would probably even agree, it's brilliant. They have the best musicians, they have the best scientists, they have the best war machine. When you see the war machine that is going to be sent forth from Germany into the world to fight in World War I, the world has never seen anything like it. The discipline, the rigor, the, the order, the logistics that support it is just like magnificent. And the world looks on in awe. And the Germans sort of know that the world should look on in awe because they know they have the superior force. And because you could say, what country in their right mind would ever go to war surrounded by Russia which has more people than the rest of the, it seems like the rest of the world combined, right? And that's like your enemy just uh, to the east, and then France, who has been noted as the greatest war power in Europe for centuries, and you're going to take them both on and at the same time antagonize Belgium and Great Britain. What country would do this? A country that believed that they could do it. And there is the fatal flaw in Germany also in World War II, ironically. In World War II, many of us understand the Hitler, well, maybe I should say we understand it, have heard or uh, have heard rumor of the Hitler superiority complex. You know, where the German, the Aryan race, the white-skinned, blonde, blue-eyed uh, ideal, that this is the superior human and the lesser human should be eradicated, okay? So this is like a thought that most of us just think is utterly grotesque. And it has definitely fallen into political bad opinion over the years. And no one would you know, boldly go forth and just say it publicly. You know, have people that cover their heads and walk around and, you know, say things like this called the Ku Klux Klan. You know, and they do things like that. But no one in their right mind would believe this anymore, right? Well, this is, this is a derivative of Germany in World War I. So they have this vulnerability to describe Germany in World War I as being... Hitler would be incorrect. They are a Christian nation, for the most part. There's a huge movement of secularism and of high-minded atheism that is sweeping into the governmental le levels and the military levels in Germany at this time, which is making them extremely vulnerable to this movement. And so they believe that their thoughts in their enciphered code are superior. And they have such a confidence in it. So I'll just read what Barbara Tuckman says on it. But my, my title on the screen says, The Vulnerability of the German. They are prone to deeming themselves the smartest in the room. Now, before I get into these quotes, it's interesting because there's two things happening. Room 40, its secret is its, if you could even say it this way, it's humility and hiddenness. It doesn't want to be seen. It is doing everything under the radar. No one is applauding it. No one is patting it on the back. Everyone that is working for it can't even say that they're working for it, right? And so it's a very unique difference because the Germans are boasting about everything they do. And they want respect. That's actually one of the things, if you look at their, their king or their emperor, no, known as Kaiser Wilhelm, we've been calling him William, he yearns to be respected. He wants to to be deemed who Germany is. He wants it to get the respect that it is due. And he doesn't feel like he's ever gotten that from England. And if, if you go back to some of my first messages, you'll understand why William feels slighted. And he never got that from Russia. And uh, Nicholas II, who's now the Tsar of Russia, his dad wouldn't even look him in the face, wouldn't look William in the face. William is the emperor of Germany. 
and, his, and the previous czar of Russia wouldn't even turn and face him. He would talk to him with a sneer over his shoulder. And so William embodies the inferiority complex of the Germans to say, we are something special. You should acknowledge us. And so you can just sort of see the perfect storm setting up here. So Barbara Tuckman says it this way. Ah, yes, the Germans were clever. But just that fatal inch short of being clever enough to suspect that their enemy might be clever too. Sublimely confident that their code was as nearly perfect as human minds could devise, was it not scientific? Was it not German? That they had, it, they, that they had used it unchanged since the first day of the war, assuming its inviolability, which means it cannot be violated. In war, never assume anything. Isn't that a great line? Every German wireless message was being grasped out of the ether and read in room 40. The Germans changed the cipher frequently. Okay, so remember, you have a code which you need the code book for. Okay, they have the code book. Yes! But there's a cipher that you have to break through to get even to understand the code and then match it up with the code book. Ah, so when you solve the cipher, then they're going to change it. And they're going to change it like every month as the war progresses. So well, that's going to make it hard. Now you have to crack a code every month to start over. Well, listen to this. So the Germans changed the cipher frequently as time went on every, every 24 hours. But being orderly Germans, they changed it according to an orderly system which once solved by the cryptoanalysts of room 40 could be solved again each time by progressing according to a constant pattern. <laughs> Doesn't that sound like the Germans? That's like classic Eric right there. It's like, okay, we'll change it and we'll change it on a predictable schedule and we'll change it to do you know, this exact change method. And the British are onto it the whole time. So they know that it changes every 24 hours and they know how it changes every 24 hours. And so as a result, you can change it all you want, but your brilliant Germanness is actually setting you up to be decoded. A quick visit to World War II. Now, I, we're in World War I, and I know I jumped to World War II in a previous message this week as well, but World War II has the same dynamic taking place in it, when it's, but you're gonna have to change the players to be Japan and America. Okay, now America has a great espionage system as well, uh, historically, and I, I don't think anyone wants to say they're as great as the, the British uh, spy network, but they're still known for being good, and in World War II, they are going to capture the Japanese codebook, which is uh, known as JN25, or the Red Book, and that is going to play a massive role in the turning point of the war for the Americans, which is called the Battle of Midway, or the Battle of Midway Island. And if you've never studied the Battle of Midway, it's worth studying. But to recognize the reason, I mean, there's, it's a David and Goliath story. The, the, when the Japanese hit Pearl Harbor, their goal was to totally uh, destroy the US Navy. Most of it parked in Pearl Harbor. And so as a result, even though they damaged it greatly, they still had a few ships left and they'd repaired a couple, but they were limping. And so they are in a very, very dangerous and susceptible place, the Americans are. And the Japanese are headed towards the western coastline of America. And so they're gonna hit Midway Island, which is a base that we have. It's just a little island. I mean, it's just like, it not, it's a little bigger than this room, but it's probably as big as this property, if you could imagine that. Okay, so it's not big, but it's a base where they can actually land planes and take off. And so they're going to know, because of the code book, they're going to interpret the communications of the Japanese and know where exactly they're headed and when. And so even though they are far lesser powered, as far as a naval power, they're going to have the ability to get the jump on the Japanese and strike the Japanese first because the Japanese would never dream that the Americans know where they're going to be and when. And of course, it's a great story. I mean, I don't want to you know, give away any spoilers here. So if you look at JN25, I've always, the way I've looked at that code book and the way I, I likened it in World War II when I was teaching on World War II, 
you know, it's called the Red Book. And I was thinking about what the Bible could be called, you know, the Red Book. You know, when you think about Jesus coming to save, he's the Word of God made flesh, and he's saving us as the red. You know, I, I gave a message called the Zone Rouge uh, earlier, and it, it's talking about the two different kinds of red that exist. You have the red of Adam, which his name even means red man, and you have the red of Jesus. And the first one will fail, the second one will succeed. And so I was thinking, what a great name for the Bible. You know, it's like a code book. It, is, it gives away the movements of the enemy, and it also gives us our directives. It's like the ultimate book for war, if you think about that, because it's, the, it's a code book to interpret and intercept enemy communications. And at the same time, it's a directive from our general of how we are to go about winning this war. Isn't that a cool concept? I was thinking of calling it the Red Book. I mean, that, that's a great name for it. But JN25, I, was, I don't know what that actually stood for, but so I looked up John 2.5, uh, figuring, you know, hey, that's, if this is our Red Book, and it was really interesting because it's, it's, it's Mary talking to, uh, to the, the people at the wedding at Cana. And, and what she is going to say is, whatever he, speaking of Jesus, says to you, do it. Isn't that a great quote on the screen? I mean, I have read that many times in my life, and it wasn't until I lifted it out, just staring at it, that I was like, that is one of the most profound enunciations of what the Bible is. The word of God uh, is spoken, do it. I mean, I, I need to build Ellerslie around that quote. That is like the essence of everything we've been teaching this first week. Whatever he says, do it. And this is going to be his first miracle. This is the advent of his Messiahship. He is coming out into the open and declaring who he, who he is. He's taking his step forward and declaring, you know that one that was prophesied? Yeah, I am he. Room 40, I'm going to call it the listening room, because that's, that's what it is. And in a, in a strange sense, now the way I'm going to uh, maneuver in this message, which is a little tricky to try and uh, uh, help you understand how, what the spiritual uh, power uh, in, that is involved in this message is, is in a sense, room 40 is sort of like that tabernacle uh, of old, but it's, it's like Jesus, where you enter in and suddenly you're able to have so much greater perspective on what's going on in the war. And you can clearly see what the enemy is doing now. Have you ever felt where you're just being hounded and harassed by the enemy, but you don't have clarity to what it is? What's interesting is in Christ, it's like you're able to decode and intercept what is taking place and make sense of it. The Word of God, the Red Book, is in a sense a clarifier that's the enemy right there yep yep 10 o'clock coming in uh, he, he's he's going to hit you this way here's what you do raise up your shield and repel you the shield i have given you will repel every missile aimed at you in other words we've been given both the insight into enemy movement at the same time the wisdom of how to deflect, how to overcome, and how to triumph in every war maneuver. So this is what Barbara Tuckman says. Wherever Germans were plotting, Hall, remember Admiral uh, Reginald Hall? Hall was listening. And like dogs who can hear high-pitched sounds that never reach the human ear, Hall could hear intrigues hatching anywhere in the war. Just, and there's a lot more to this, guys. I'm giving you, again, the skim milk version, but probably enough to get, you know, make you guys fascinated. Where, but I don't want you distracted from all that we're teaching you at Ellerslie for you to start studying the British spy network. So God's JN25, his red book, doesn't just reveal his wisdom for battle, which is an incredible statement because the Bible gives us wisdom for battle. You want to understand what to do, you ask for wisdom. God will always give it. And so you go to the JN25, you go to the Red Book, you go to the Word of God, and he will always give you precisely what you need. He will direct you in every military movement. But it also reveals the enemy's movements. Now, I know I just said this, but I want you to catch this. Because at Ellerslie, we're actually going to unpack this idea. Nathan Johnson has a message 
called The Nine Lies, okay? And that's like a classic Ellerslie message that goes into the book of Nehemiah and shows Sanballat, Tobias, and Geshem the Arabian, those that are opposed to Nehemiah's construction project, they're going to attack, if you want to say it that way, they're going to try and manipulate, they're going to try and counter with nine different military movements. And I'm not going to go into those today because I don't want to spoil that message for you. But what's interesting is when you study those nine movements, you're going to say those are the same nine movements that he uses against me. That's weird because you go back to the ancient world and the devil is still doing the same thing. He's like the Germans that never change their code book, that just presume that they're smarter than anything else. And so as a result, the enemy seems to play us as dumb and either that or he lacks creativity is another one of my thoughts that I've, I've had throughout the years because in the, in the most extraordinary fashion, when you study the word of God, you know the enemy's movements. And so one of the statements you'll hear me say a lot is classic enemy, mm, classic devil right there. So you could share a story and they're like, oh yeah, that's classic devil. Oh he's, yeah, he's working to bring that division. Oh yeah, he's working to try and bait you with unforgiveness. Oh yeah, he's, he's trying to bait you towards uh, sensuality there. Yeah, this is just classic. This is how he works. There's nothing new under the sun when it comes to the devil. He works according to what we could almost like call a pre-prescribed plan. And so as a result, as code breakers, we can come in and upset the apple cart. We've been given the code breaking device. We've been given the German code book. We've been given the JN25. We've been given the red book. And as a result, we can spoil the enemy's great plans that he has. I mean, he's like, he, 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 you know, in his little secret corner of the world. And yet we have a he, he, he all our own. And so we're sort of like the British code breakers. You've always wanted to be one of the British code breakers. Now you're like, oh, I like the sound of that error. Could you say it again? You are one of those British code breakers. Isn't that, doesn't that feel good? Yeah, you're a believer. So 2 Kings 6, 8 through 12 is going to talk about, I mean, it's, it's funny because it's indirectly talking about Elisha. So the prophet Elisha, who's going to get a double portion of what Elijah has, right? And the Syrian king is having a nightmare of a problem. He's trying to go to war against Israel. But there's a problem. There's a code breaker in the mix that is catching wireless communications and everyone is getting caught in his room 40. And so let's listen. Now the king of Syria was making war against Israel and he consulted with his servants saying, my camp will be in such and such a place. And the man of God sent to the king of Israel saying, so the man of God is Elisha. So the man of God sent to the king of Israel saying, beware that you do not pass this place for the Syrians are coming down there. He just picked up a wireless communication. The king of Syria is plotting something and guess what? Elisha knows about it. And you're like, how, how did that work? Uh, how, how did that work? How did Elisha know that? Then the king of Israel sent someone to that place of which the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him and he was watchful there, not just once, or twice. So in other words, what we see happening is that Elisha keeps picking up and intercepting wireless communications out of Syria. And so the king of Syria is rather frustrated because everything he is plotting to do, Elisha seems to pick up on it and know what he's up to. And so they keep moving their soldiers and their troops into these places. And as a result, it's offsetting the movement of the Syrians. Oh, that's frustrating. Uh, it seems like we're missing a, a letter. Uh, therefore, it says here for, therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? He's assuming that someone is a secret mole in their midst that is giving away what is taking place. And listen to the comment back. And one of his servants said, none, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. <laughs> this isn't going to go over very well with the king of Syria. And that's what's going to cause him to send forth his army to go get this man of God who is intercepting his wireless communications. And that's when, I don't know if you guys remember the story. I mean, 
you may have already heard it because Nathan loves to bring that story up. So do I. It's one of our favorite stories. And it, it deserves being brought up in so many contexts, right? But remember, the, the servant gets up in the morning and, whoa, there's this whole army around him. And then Elisha comes out with his coffee, you know, and then the man of God or the, the servant says, alas, my master, what shall we do? Anyway, they're surrounded by Syrians. And Elisha is just like, you know, look, uh, don't you see? The greater are those that are with us than those that are with them. The, and Lord, open my servant's eyes that he would see. And he sees the mountains full of horses and chariots of fire all around. And then with one word, Elisha blinds the entire Syrian army. That's a pretty cool story. That really doesn't have to do with our JN25 you know, code book, but it's still you know, a great moment in history. However, what we see is that there is a an ability that Elisha has to pick up wireless communication. I know I'm calling it wireless communication, but communication that he should not know. And I'm going to say it this way. As a believer, when you rest in Christ and when you do your work in the humility and the hiddenness of Christ, that you will know what you need to know to win this battle. You will be like an Admiral Hall with the ability to pick up that which you need to discern that which you must have to be victorious. I have said this to Leslie so many times that there is an ability that we have as believers to just rest because we've had a lot of schemes that have come against the two of us and against this ministry. And it's weird, don't you think, that schemes would come against people? Because it's like we're just minding our own business, just trying to stand for Jesus, and schemes will be awakened. Now, I'm not going to go into what those schemes are. Just trust me, okay? There have been schemes that have come against us, and yet, before the scheme can work, God gives us insight. And as a result, we sort of move our forces to one spot, and it counteracts something that we didn't fully understand. And then in hindsight, we look back and go, God, how did you move us into that position? And yet when you are in room 40, and when you dwell in room 40, God's style, speaking of Christ and knowing the Holy Spirit, it's like he gives you that insight, that discernment, that understanding for the battle. It's called wisdom. I mean, that's what you're getting. You're getting wisdom. You're getting insight. You're getting understanding to truly know how to win this thing. And there is a tremendous peace that can come because a lot of Christians are focused on what we could call conspiracies right now. I don't know if, if you've lingered near anyone who has ever brought up a conspiracy uh, that is taking place in the world today, but there's a lot of them and there always have been, okay? There is always like some group of intellectuals out there that are, you know, above everything and, you know, have no law, they're a law unto themselves that are out to destroy the Christians, okay? So if you live in Christianity, you can brush up against this. Now, here's the key. Do we fear what man can do to us? No, is the simple answer as believers. Therefore, it really doesn't matter what the enemy is scheming what the king of syria is scheming he is scheming you I mean, we just caught him red-handed in the bible scheming to take israel and yet guess what god <clears throat> should not be belittled god has his own spy network and he is very good at moving his saints into position at just the right time to counter it and so as a result, I have found a great rest in my soul that I don't need to focus on what the enemy is doing, but if I just focus on what God is doing, what he is asking of me, I will always be in the right position to address the enemy's movements. Our very predictable enemy. Now, I already mentioned you know, the book of Nehemiah, which is a profound demonstration of the predictability of the enemy. But Paul is going to reference the same thing. In 2 Corinthians 2.11, he's talking about forgiveness in Christ. And he's going to say, lest Satan should take advantage of us. In other words, we should forgive, lest Satan should actually gain advantage. And listen, for we are not ignorant of his devices. We know exactly what he's up to. This is classic enemy. He's trying to get us to stumble for unforgiveness. So he's trying to create a grievance over here. 
so that it could disturb our soul and so that we would open up a door of access through unforgiveness in our life. But we're not dumb. We're not going to fall for that one, are we? And so as a result, when you recognize you have the code book, it actually explains this very thing. His devices, the enemy's devices, so that you cannot just be where God wants you to be, but you can know what the enemy is doing to the degree that is necessary to preserve your soul and to preserve the church, to preserve your marriage, to preserve your family. Room 40, where mysteries are solved. Now, there's a reason why I'm bringing up room 40, and it's not just because it's intriguing. It's also because it's going to play into the rest of World War I. And I've been setting up a story. You know, I've been hanging out in the Wild West. I don't know that since you guys have been here, I've visited the Wild West, have I, in this week? Okay, so you guys haven't enjoyed any Mexican-American battles, uh, which seem very jarring and weird in light of a European conflict. However, something is happening. Remember that transatlantic cable to the United States from Germany was snipped and then coiled up and you know, the British hauled it off. And so the Germans don't have the ability to communicate privately. And they're going to have to communicate something of great importance that is going to get intercepted by room 40. See, I, I'm setting you up for this. I'm not going to say anything more about it. But that something, that morsel that they are going to catch, they are going to catch while intercepting an American line of communication, which they're technically not supposed to deal with. And so how do they communicate with the Americans what they just intercepted when the fact that they intercepted it shows that they're violating their confidences with America? But America really needs to know this. Oh, this is good. Aren't you guys excited about this? Intrigue! Room 40, where mysteries are solved. The power of carrying the code book. When you have the code book, and you have access to the code book, and you know the code book, you see, when these crypto analysts would look over a document that would just be gibberish to you, the more familiar they are with the code book, the more they could see something and actually see a big number, like a five, six-digit number, and know exactly what it is. And they recognize it. They're familiar with it. It's like, oh, that's talking about Mexico. Oh, that's talking about Japan. Oh, that's Zimmerman. And they are going to put together something by leveraging this code book. For us, it's a similar familiarity. When you become familiar with your code book, I know most of us have never thought of the Bible as being a code book. It's sort of fun uh, to think about it that way. But the more familiar you get, the more you recognize the enemy, the more you recognize God. It's like, ah, classic God. Oh, uh-huh, the enemy's moving over here. Yeah, I can see him. Yeah, <laughs> he thinks we're going to fall for that one. You see, the enemy is a dead giveaway. He can't hide himself when we have the code book. When we don't have the code book, he's very elusive. He's covered in mirror, and we can't quite see his movements. We can't quite discern him. And so as a result, when we have the code book, it explodes his devices, his plots, and his schemes. So the power of carrying the code book, it sets you up to change the world. So Acts 8, 26 through 35, we have a character named Philip. And Philip has a code book. You see, the Bible is a code book, right? But what they've been needing is a key to the code book for all these years. So the Jews have looked at the Old Testament and it's been a mystery. But now suddenly Jesus is going to come and he's going to hand them everything they need to interpret and to unlock this code book. And Philip has the code book, plus now he has the key. And what we're going to see happen is this. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. So he's typically known as the Ethiopian Jew. He's obviously coming to worship in Jerusalem. He's a Jew from Ethiopia working under Candace. And he's in the wilderness. So he's a Jew in the wilderness, which is a great symbol of anyone who does not yet have the key to the mystery. 
They have a code book, but it doesn't make any sense to them. They need a key to unlock it. And so as a result, you're going to see Philip come in with the key to unlock everything. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. And the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away and who will declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth. Now what's interesting is because you have had the code book and because you've had the key of Jesus Christ and him crucified your entire life, you know what that's talking about. You could probably even tell me what scripture in Isaiah it was. That's Isaiah chapter 53. That's talking about Jesus the Messiah. And yet the Ethiopian Jew doesn't see it because he doesn't have the key. He has the book. He doesn't have the key to unlock it. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask of you, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning that this scripture preached Jesus to him. You see, you have the answer for your own soul in Jesus Christ. He's given you this book and that book unlocks the mystery of Christ. Christ is this great mystery. It's the revelation of him in us and through us, even through the Gentiles. It's this great mystery. It's been hidden for ages and generations and is now revealed. So here's our Greek word, mysterion. Isn't that a cool word? Of course, we could probably guess what it means just by looking at it, right? The mystery. And this word is going to be used, I want to say like 27 times in the New Testament. And it's an extremely interesting study in and of itself. But Paul is always talking about a mystery, a mystery that is hidden, a mystery that is now revealed, a mystery that he is entrusted, a mystery that is Christ, a mystery that is Christ in us, a mystery, I mean, this is, this is his term. He even talks about marriage as being a great mystery, right? Because it's revealing another realm. And so are we called to reveal another realm. It's a mystery that God would choose us to be a mobile holy of holies in this earth. The mysterion has been solved. The code has been broken. The key is Jesus Christ. So listen to this statement, Matthew 13, 11. It's also going to be stated in Mark 4, 11 and Luke 8, 10. It is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Isn't that a great statement of what we have been entrusted? We have been entrusted the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. The primary mystery is the Christ revealed. But then the following subsequent mis mysteries, Christ revealed in us. Christ revealed through us. Christ revealed through all that we do. Are, are you actually saying that we humans are the delivery vehicle of the unseen realm? That's exactly what I'm saying. And this is the mystery that Paul is so excited about sharing and that he's going to write multiple letters to share this mystery that he is found in Christ that has been hidden for ages and generations but is now revealed. And in Colossians, he simply says, Christ in us, the hope of glory. And so you have access to the code book, to the key, to unlock and to break the great mystery and to solve it for your own life. But not so that you can just have it in your own life, but so that you can carry this mystery, carry this code book with you, carry the key inside of it, and to bring it to everyone that you meet to help them break the code of their own soul the mystery that hovers over them, the cloud, the fog, so that they too can be set free. Father, thank you for your great gift. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the tremendous power that is vested in that word. And Lord, I pray that we would treat it with such respect and deep appreciation. Lord, that we would handle it with a greater dexterousness and a greater fear of God. For Lord, you have given us what we need 
You have given us wisdom. You have given us insight. You have given us understanding so that we can live fully for you. We're so appreciative, so grateful, Lord. It's in the precious name of Jesus that we pray this. Amen.